understand that it is fairly major. So he requests our prayer on behalf of his, of his wife, Melinda Harab, our sister in Christ. Bella Karras has a tonsillectomy scheduled for tomorrow, and the family requests our prayer. We also understand that Dennis Gray's brother, Ronnie Gray, is not, he's having some health difficulties of late, and we're also glad to see Dennis back with us today. Our sister, Florine King, is in the hospital. She is at Tanner Medical Center in Carrollton. She's at room 229. She's having some heart difficulties, Brother Hubert says. They're hopeful that she can go home today, but we'll see. But family, or the family requests our prayer on her behalf. Are there others that we need to make specific mention of? Tonight is our fifth Sunday singing. We're looking forward to that and worship in song. So if you're a song leader, come prepared for a few songs tonight. Tonight will be our fifth Sunday singing event. For those that were Bible school teachers this quarter that ends today, please make your perfect attendance list and get that to Jimmy and Jan as soon as you can. Our directory pictures begin this week, later this week. They begin Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hopefully you remember your appointment. Can they go online and get that if they need it? They can go online and get that if you need a reminder as to when your appointment is. But again, our directory pictures start this week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and they will continue next week as well. Nope. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So if you have an appointment, please fulfill that appointment so that we can keep our directory as complete as possible. In connection with that, Connie Higley is going to make some pictures for those that are uh, volunteers on a regular basis, song leaders, educational supervisors, tech team, volunteer workers, and so forth. But you will be contacted concerning that specifically so that we can know exactly. That will be next Sunday morning after the AM service, correct? Next Sunday morning after the AM service, those pictures will be made. Okay, Brothers Keepers Group 4, this is Chad Reagan's group. We'll meet at the home of Eric and Mary this coming Saturday, December the 6th, 6 p.m. Donations for the December project for Group 2, Gary and Jamie's group, need to be turned in by next Sunday. Also, Robert and Cheryl's Group 1 are participating in that event as well. So Groups 1 and 2, December project donations due next Sunday. The work on our foyer bathrooms continues. Most of the, dry, well, the drywall was complete yesterday. The painting was complete yesterday. We'll have some more demolition of the tile and tile floor hopefully uh, this week. So that continues, but we do have some more work days scheduled the next couple of Saturdays, right, Robert? The next couple of Saturdays. Okay. Our holiday party is Saturday, December the 13th, 4.30 p.m. here at the building. It's gonna be catered. The cost is $9.50 per person. If you have yet to give your money to Mark or Deborah, we would ask you to do so as soon as possible. If you're writing a check, do that to the Bremen Church of Christ. Children are welcome to bring the Happy Meal of their choice. The Good Samaritans have a shopping trip planned for a family that we have selected to help that is related to one of our members here. That is Sunday, December the 14th, after the morning service. You'll meet, eat, and then shop. If you wish to make a donation for this, Please see Eric or Mary. Let's enter into our worship service. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we're so grateful for the many blessings of life. Father, we're grateful that our country has set aside a time this past week so that we could pause and be thankful for our many blessings. Father, we know that if we named them one by one, we couldn't. We're so thankful for the many physical blessings that you shower upon us each day. Father, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that a child of thine can enjoy. Father, we pray that everything that's said and done in this place today, specifically in this worship service, will be according to thy will. You'll be pleased with it. We'll be edified as a result. We're forgiven of anything in our lives that's amiss so that we may worship thee in spirit and in truth. Father, we're mindful of these that we've mentioned specifically this morning that are in the hospital, that have procedures upcoming, that are struggling from some event in their family, for those that are looking after those that are not doing well. 
Father, may they know that we are praying for them. May they know that they can draw strength from us. And may we seek opportunities to help them and encourage them in their time of trial. Father, we know that there are several others that are still bereaving over the loss of loved ones. Father, may each person that has a public role in our worship this morning prepare themselves in such a way that they may do this in accordance to thy will and much good come from it. Forgive us as we fail thee, Father. Be with us through the remainder of this service and whatever future life that you see best for us. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May we continue our worship now and stand and sing number 166. O oh, worship of the King of glorious above and gratefully sing His wonderful love. O oh, shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor and guarded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what come can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in the dew we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Be seated, please. In preparation for the Lord's Supper this morning, number 447. 447. <clears throat> King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony. to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourn and wear. Angels in robes of light arrayed, God at the whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be with Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to 
share Thou hast borne all for me Lest I forget Gethsemane Lest I forget Thine agony Lest I forget Thy love for me Lead me to Calvary Would you bow with me please? Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Jesus. We're so thankful that you saw fit to send him to this earth. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for his life that he lived, his example he gave for each one of us. Our Heavenly Father, now as we protect of this feast, our Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we think back and think about his body that was slain on each one of our behalves. Our Heavenly Father, we're sorry for our sins that caused you to have to send him to that cross. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this bread as we partake of it, and we pray that we think back of behind his body. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Did we miss anyone in our serving? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to gather around this table and remember the death of Jesus. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your love for us and his love for us that you were willing to send him and he was willing to come to earth and endure such a, a cruel and agonizing death and shed his blood on the cross for each and every one of us. Dear Lord, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins to help to put him on that cross. We also pray that you will bless this cup, which to us as Christians represents his blood that was shed on that cross. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Was anyone overlooked in the serving of the cup? This concludes the Lord's Supper. It's another act to worship. We're commanded to give back to God as we've been prospering. Let us pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all our blessings that you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, as we had this past week, as we get time to think about everything we should be thankful for, Heavenly Father, we realize that we would never be able to thank you enough for everything that you do for us. Our Heavenly Father, we have so many numerous physical and spiritual blessings that we would never be able to repay you for everything. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you allow us to be stewards over this earth. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we're good stewards and we do what we're supposed to do with the everything that you have given to us. Our Heavenly Father, as we give back to you now, we pray that these funds will go to spread your kingdom. And we praise all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Number 232, 232. Me. 
kam voll still. My table has furnished in present of my foes. My head now does with oil anoint. My head now does with oil anoint. And my cup overflows. Good and mercy, oh, my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore, and in God's house forevermore, Amen. Before our prayer, number 51. 51. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. When I tread the back of Jordan, Bid my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current. Land me safe on Canaan side. Strong in praises I will ever give to thee. Songs of praises I will bow. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you, God, for blessing us with the opportunity to be here today, to study from your holy word, and to worship you. We ask, God, that you please continue with us in this course of worship be with Brother Johnny as he continues to lead, lead us in song, and Brother Chad as he will present from your word. Help us, God, to do our very best to be attentive to the things that will be spoken, to participate willingly in the song service, to do our very best to be actively involved in this sacrifice of worship to you so that it will be pleasing to you. Thank you, God, for your infinite wisdom in giving us the church for strength, for giving us this local congregation of your people. We thank you, God, for each soul that makes it up. We thank you, God, for the good work that gets done through the efforts of each person here. Help us, to God, God, to do our very best to use ourselves up in your service. We ask, God, that you be with those that were mentioned as needing your help and needing our prayers, those who are sick or will be having surgery, those who are dealing with difficult situations in life, or tough times. Please give them, God, the blessings that they need the most. 
We ask that you continue to be with our nation, be with those serving this nation, be with those leading it, and help us, God, through our example, do our very best to show that we are Christians and we're living for you every day, to show the light of your Son in our lives, and to do our best to influence others for good, for we know we have influence one way or the other. But help us, God, to keep ourselves as pure and clean as we can and to be cognizant always of our actions and our words and to do our best to help others see the truth. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice for our sin and his willingness to die for us. We ask forgiveness, Lord, of the sins that we have committed that have put Jesus on the cross and help us to have penitent hearts to recognize our mistakes and to do our best to fix them and to live pure and clean as we can going forward. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Please mark number eight as the invitation song, number eight. Before the lesson, we'll sing number 577. 577, do you know my Jesus? Let's stand and sing verses one and three for our lesson this morning, number 577. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know? Jesus, do you know, my friend, have you heard, he loves you, and that he will abide till the end, who knows your dear Appointments Who is each time we cry Who understands your heart aches? Who dries the tears from your eyes Do you know My tears do you know, my friend, have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Be seated. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Have several visiting with us. Some that we know and recognize quite well. Others that I hope to meet before leaving today. Some are home for Thanksgiving still visiting. Good to have Mr. and Mrs. Reeves. We are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. As I mentioned last week, uh, in, in verses 21 through the end of the chapter, in chapter 5, Jesus is expounding on his statement of verse 20. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven here representing the church. Uh, Paul talking to the Colossian brethren in Ch Colossians 1.13 mentions that they had been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, so the kingdom here representing the church. Jesus is uh, laying out some guidelines. I, I don't even know if we would call them necessarily guidelines. I don't want us to 
they are guidelines, but I don't want us to think of them as a checklist. He's not just giving us things that we can just check off, but he's, he's giving uh, characteristics that will describe li uh, the lives of citizens of the new kingdom that is to come. But when he says, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, uh, what, what does he mean? That's what verses 21 to 48 are dealing with. We looked last week at two of these and look at the remaining four. We, we, talk, we noticed last week these are broken down into statements of, you have heard that it has been said, and, but I say unto you. And he's, he's expounding on what the law really said. Uh, he's not contradicting the law. We'd already talked about that where he said, I, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, the law was going to pass away because it was always intended to pass away. It was never intended to be permanent, always was intended to be temporary, leading us to the Christ. Paul will deal with that in Galatians chapter 3. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We've used the illustration before, and I, not original with me, but the idea of a school bus. Uh, when, you, when I was a kid, I, I rode the school bus uh, for many years, and they would pick you up right there at the house, and you were in the bus driver's care. And if you misbehaved or whatever, uh, you, were, you were under that person's supervision. Sometimes they might end up sending you to the principal's office or something like that. Not that, that ever happened. But uh, you, that, that might happen to someone. And you're under their supervision. But when you arrive at the school, then you are, you're at your destination. And they hand you off to the care of the teachers, principals, and so on and so forth. And so you're no longer under the care of the school bus driver at that point. You've reached the point at which you've arrived. That's what you were aiming toward. And so that's what, that's what Paul says about the old law. It was intended to bring us to Christ. Christ having come, died on the cross, fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, done what he came to do to purge our sins. Now the kingdom is in existence. We're no longer under that old law. We're under the law of Christ. We've talked numerous times about getting into his kingdom. It, it is, uh, again, it's not just a checklist, but citizens of the kingdom are those who believe that Christ is the king of the kingdom. He is the Messiah. He says, if you believe not that I am, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. Citizens of the kingdom are those who, having believed in him as the king, they put their faith and trust in him, they give their lives to him. We, we often refer to that as repentance. It's, it's a change of mind. I decide I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm giving my life to the Lord because he gave his life for me. We love him because he first loved us. So we often talk about repentance. We sometimes talk about confessing Jesus' name as Lord. He says if we don't do that, he won't confess us before the Father. If we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And of course, citizens of the kingdom are those who have been born again, John 3, 3 through 5. Not, not entering the second time to their mother's womb. Nicodemus was confused on that. And Jesus says, no, being born of water, and of the Spirit, baptism into Christ. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was just coming into existence, the first gospel sermon ever was preached by Peter and the other apostles. And, and when he says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they cry out, what? What shall we do? And the answer comes back from heaven through Peter. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A man named Saul, who was a persecutor, later turned preacher. When he's fasting, he's praying in the city of Damascus, having seen Jesus on the Lord to Damascus. And he says, what, what would you have me to do, Lord? And, and the Lord tells him to go into Damascus and you'll be told. And the man named Ananias comes to him and says, why are you waiting? Acts 22, 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Those who have believed in Jesus Christ, put their faith and trust in him, given their lives to him, confessed him as Lord, and been immersed in water to have their sins washed away are added by the Lord to his kingdom, the church. Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we're dealing here with the lives of citizens of the kingdom, and I say all that to say that we need to be in the kingdom. We, we, you know, you know, I'm skipping ahead down to the conclusion, but <clears throat> if you notice on the handout, at the heart of the matter, Christianity is a matter of the heart. But if God doesn't have my heart, then all this is a moot point. And so we've got to make sure we're in the kingdom. And so this morning, when the time comes and we extend heaven's invitation, if you're not in the Lord's kingdom, that's the first order of business. But let's notice some other things that characterize lives of citizens of the kingdom of Christ. He's going to deal with 
continuing the thought is that there was just no way to fit it all in last week, and so I had to break it down into uh, two different sermons. But continuing with the you've heard that it has been said or that you've heard that it was said, uh, notice what he says beginning in verse 31. He's going to deal with marriage and divorce. He says, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now, you probably have a cross-reference in your Bible if you have cross-references in your Bible. <clears throat> Back to Matthew, uh, or over to Matthew 19, verses, I don't know, 4 to 9, 1, 1 through 9, however you want to break that down to that section. But about the first nine verses of Matthew, Jesus deals with this as well. Now, when he says it causes her to commit adultery, it's not that this situation is one, and it works man or woman, either way, but he says you're not forcing your spouse to commit adultery. It's just you're putting, especially with, in the culture that they were in, if a man divorces his wife, he puts her in a situation where she's typically going to want to seek companionship. She's going to want to seek someone to help provide for her, care for her. And so you're putting her in a situation where you're making it very likely to, you're, you're basically encouraging her. So he's not saying you're forcing anybody to do anything, but it's a situation, and that's still true even to this day, even if nothing but for the aspect of companionship. Now, that is a difficult situation for folks. But Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and Matthew 19, 9 are passages that they don't need a whole lot of explaining. They need a whole lot of obeying. And that's, that's a difficulty in our time because we live in a day and age of rampant divorce and remarriage. And I, I say this a lot, but I believe it with all my heart, that we need more teaching. I'm not saying we don't need to teach on divorce and remarriage, but we need more teaching on marriage and understand going into this thing what it is and how important it is. And so I want to look at that just uh, very briefly and understand that we've got a lot more to cover. But Jesus is dealing here with the institution of marriage. The institution of marriage, you understand that marriage, it, it's sacred. This is something that is not from man. Man didn't come up with this. God did. In Genesis 2, God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I, God says, I will make and help meet or help help her suitable for him. And so this, this thing we call marriage, it, it didn't come from man. It came from God. There are four foundational laws that we can find in Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Uh, really, could just about preach a sermon on this. I almost deleted it from my slide. I didn't have room for it in the handout. I almost deleted it from the slide just so I could preach it later. But, but I'm going to go ahead and cover it because I think it's important. Maybe we'll unpack it a little bit more later on uh, at a later date. But there are four foundational laws of marriage. I, I'm convinced that most marriages, might even be fair to say all, fail because one or more of these foundational laws is broken. But there's the law of priority. Your spouse comes first. That means before mama. That means before daddy. That means before the children. Your spouse comes first. A lot of marriages fail because people don't respect and honor the law of priority. Sometimes there are problems and they want, they want to run back to mom and dad and listen to what all's going on and, uh, you know, you might be surprised to find out that most moms and dads take the side of their baby girl or, or their little boy as they view them. And so that causes some problems. Sometimes this is violated because people put their children ahead. And so sometimes you see situations where, you know, you've probably heard people talk about it. Here the children go off to college and all of a sudden you look across the table one day and who is this person? You've invested no time in one another because the children have been your priority. But children are born to grow up. And if, if all things are equal and everything is going as it should, children are growing, they're developing, they're preparing to leave the house. And they're going to be on their own. Then what? You've got to respect the law of priority. Spouse comes first. Now, that doesn't mean that you neglect the children. It doesn't mean you neglect your parents. It's not an either or. You can honor your parents. You can take care of children. But you do that as a team, realizing that my spouse comes first. There's the law of priority. There are also... The law of pursuit. You've got to pursue one another. Marriage requires work. Sometimes I've heard people make the statement, marriage doesn't work for me, or my marriage didn't work for me. Marriages don't work more often than not because the people in the marriage don't work at the marriage. When you stop working at marriage, it'll stop working for you, guaranteed. Marriage requires work. I've heard people say, you know, 
marriage as it ought to be, just, it just happens. People are so in love, and that's just, that's just the way it ought to be. It shouldn't require work. That person, bless his heart, he, he, something's wrong. He doesn't know anything about marriage, or, or maybe he's just deluded or something. But any time you have interpersonal relationships, they're going to require work. Marriage especially so, because you take two people that, no matter how similar they may be, there are differences. And to live together and spend their lives together, it requires work. There's the law of pursuit. There's also the law of possession. The two become one in all things, whether it be uh, in matters of finance, uh, you know, in matters of what their goals are, their aims. You, the two have to become one. They're no more twain but one flesh. We often, uh, people have often pointed out that's reference to the sexual relationship, and it certainly is, but, but it's also to other things as well. Two become one in all things. Don't want to get to where we're two separate people. We want to be one. The law of possession is violated. There's going to be trouble in marriage. And then there's also the law of purity. When, in verse 25 of Genesis 2 says, They were naked, the man and woman, they were naked, and they were not ashamed. <clears throat> so there's, there's this, the idea of nakedness in marriage, not just in a physical sense. There's, there's something there that's reserved just for one another and as, as, refer, as it relates to the sexual union. But we're talking in, in emotional nakedness, openness spiritual openness in all things this law of purity and when it's broken one starts keeping secrets there, there's this there's reservedness with with opening up that that generally is going to cause problems so there's the institution of marriage it is from god it is sacred man didn't come up with this <clears throat> there's also the importance of marriage that we have to talk about it is foundationally a covenant relationship malachi 2 14 talks about the lord's been witness He's speaking to those Jews, said, The Lord has been witness against thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. This is a covenant we point out many times in wedding ceremonies. It's not just a covenant between a man and a woman. It's a covenant between these two people and God. So they are bound together and they're bound by God and they're bound to God. It is foundationally a covenant relationship and that's important. And then, of course, there's the intention of marriage. God intended marriage to be permanent. God always intended marriage to be one man, one woman for life. We have no right to sever that relationship. There's one exception given in Matthew 19.9, and that is for someone who has had their spouse cheat on them, commit fornication. That innocent party may put away his or her spouse. Other than that, Romans 7, 1 to 4, or 1 to 3, the, the rule is given. Marriage is one man, one woman for life. Now, it's not like that in our day and age. What changed? What changed it? S-I-N, sin. You see marriages that break up. Somewhere along the way, sin is involved. We cannot sever the marriage relationship without dealing with serious consequences. And we need to understand that, and we need to respect that. And so Jesus talks about marriage and divorce here. And if we understand that more going into marriage, maybe less marriages would be broken up, and we would be more motivated to work at them as we ought to, understanding that when you sever the marriage ties, there are consequences, many times consequences that last for a lifetime. So Jesus is dealing with marriage and divorce. And then moving on in chapter 5, He's going to talk about oaths in verse 33. Again, you've heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Well, notice a few things here. The concept is that of, of taking oaths. This was a fairly common practice among the Jews, the, this idea of taking oaths. It, what you're doing is you're calling on God as a witness to the truthfulness of what you're saying. Even to this day in the court of law, they'll ask you to put your hand on the Bible. I don't know if they still do that anymore in our secularized society. They try to get God out of everything. But, you know, it always used to be that you put your hand on the Bible and, uh, you know, you, you raise your one hand on the Bible and you raise your right hand and, You'd say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Well, that's the idea of taking an oath, calling God as witness to the truthfulness of what I'm about to say. 
Sometimes even today you'll hear people say, oh, no, 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 I'm telling the truth. I swear to God. And it gets thrown around pretty lightly, really, and frivolously, and they would do that many times as well. But here's the thing. Why did they have this concept? Because people lied. The same reason that today when you have a fellow stand up or, or, or take the seat there on the witness stand in a court of law, you have to have him swear to tell the truth. Why can you not just get a fellow up there and say, hey, are you going to tell the truth? And he says, yes, sir, and you go on. Because people lie. And so it's understanding that we're going to put you under oath to, to make sure you understand there are consequences. People, even as children, they do this. You, you, know, you ever remember when you were children and somebody promised something and you say, oh, you know, I have my fingers crossed. People say stuff like that. Well, it's okay for me to lie if I got my fingers crossed. All bets are off if your fingers are crossed. And, you know, I remember even sometimes as children, we'd say, get your hands up in the air. We want to see them. And then uh, I had a guy I went to school with one time. He said, no, my toes were crossed. I said, I didn't, never even heard of that. But he, they looking for a loophole. That's what this is about. So they would commonly take oaths. That's, that's the concept. But there was, a, there was a corruption that they had. And the, their corruption was that they, would made, they made this distinction that God never made between binding oaths and non-binding oaths. Now, if you want to turn with me, I'm going to read from Matthew 23. Hold your spot there if you, if you, do, if you do turn. But I'm going to read from Matthew 23, beginning at verse 16, because Jesus is dealing with the same concept here. He says, Woe unto you, you blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. Non-binding. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Oh, you're bound by that. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold of the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, they said, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he's guilty. You see, binding oaths, non-binding oaths, the distinction that they're making, that's not there in God's book. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift of the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein, God. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. You see, they had this distinction between binding, non-binding oaths, and Jesus said, no, you make an oath, you should keep it. And that brings us to the next thing here, and there's, there's been confusion on this. In fact, uh, when, I was, when I was a child, sometimes somebody would say something, uh, we got a bunch of guys sitting around at school, and you tell something that maybe, was, maybe sounded hard to believe, and one of them would say, uh-uh, that, there's no way that happened. you say, yes, it did. And he'd say, you swear? And, and I mean, I, I remember as a child, it would sometimes give us great swelling pride to say, oh, no, I don't swear. I, I will promise that what I'm saying is true, but I don't swear. And so there's some confusion. Some people won't take oaths even to this day based on this passage. There have been people get in the courtroom. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? No, but I will affirm. And I wouldn't want anybody to violate their conscience, but it's, a, it's just a misunderstanding because you have instances in the, in the Scripture where the Father makes an oath. In fact, Psalm 110, verse 4, it's a prophecy concerning Christ. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Reference to Jesus, the Christ. Well, God swore. In fact, even it's quoted over in the book of Hebrews, and the Hebrews writer will say in another passage, you know, because he could swear by no greater, God swore by himself that he would do this thing. And so God made oaths. Jesus, in Matthew 26, 20, uh, 63, the high priest, he, he's upset with Jesus, and he says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us whether you're the Christ or not. He's calling God as witness. It would be the same thing today as if one of us saying, do you swear to God that you are the Christ? Now, that's a perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, hold on, I don't take oaths, and no godly person takes oaths. But Jesus, he answers, thou sayest. It is as you say, we would say it in our day and age. It is just as you say. He, he made an oath. In fact, we could give other Old Testament uh, examples as well. Paul made oaths, 2 Corinthians 1, 23, where he, he says, I call God for a record. It's the same thing. He's, he's calling God to witness the truthfulness of what he was saying. Galatians 1, 20, the things I write unto you are before God, I lie not. He's calling God as witness. And then the Old Testament examples, Abraham swore to Abimelech, Genesis 21, 23, and 24. Uh, Abraham made his servant swear that he would not have Isaac marry a non 
Jewish person, who was somebody who was not of the family of Abraham. He, he made him swear to that. Uh, Genesis 31, you have another instance of, of taking an oath. You have Je uh, Joseph swearing to Jacob, his father. Genesis chapter 47, verse 31. On and on we could go. And so there, that's not what Jesus is getting at here. He's not saying don't ever make an oath. Now again, people can get pretty frivolous with that, and it doesn't need to be thrown around lightly. And that brings us to the conclusion. What Jesus is getting at here, what is the lesson <clears throat> that he's trying to teach if it's not don't make oaths? The idea here is let your word be your bond. Have you ever known somebody that the only way you could trust them is if you'd say, all right, do you, do you promise? Do you swear? You know, some people even say, I swear, and you still don't believe them. They say, look, I swear on my mother's grave or something like that. Even then you doubt them. Why? It's a person who lies. You can't trust them. I knew a young lady one time. <clears throat> she was in my youth group one time. and She said, uh, said something one time, and she said, listen, I, I, I promise, promise. I said, say what? And she said, I promise, promise. She said, you know if I say I promise, promise, I'm telling the truth. And I said, so if you just say it or if you just promise, you might be lying. She said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> she had to think about that for a minute. But that's the way some folks are. If they say a certain thing, fingers crossed, I, I didn't promise, promise, or I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't swear on a stack of Bibles, or I didn't swear to God, then they might be lying. Jesus says, be a man of your word. Be a woman of your word. When you say yes, mean yes. Don't be a person. Everybody's got to wonder, is he lying unless, he, unless I get his hand on the Bible or something like that? Be a person that they say, you know what, if, if that fellow said it, I know it's right because he doesn't lie. I was listening to my kids in the car one time. We were driving somewhere. One of them said something, and I believe it was Rachel that said, uh-uh. said, that's not right because my dad says such and such, and she said, and he doesn't usually lie. I said, wait a minute. I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I need to take a step back and look at this thing about making oaths for myself here. I don't know, maybe, maybe my children misunderstand something. But uh, I, said, I asked her, I said, hang on. She said, okay, oh, yeah, he, he doesn't tell lies. So, but that's what Jesus is getting at. Be a person of your word. Would you say yes or no? People understand that's what you mean. He's not saying don't ever take oaths. Well, let's, let's go on and look at Jesus' teaching on retaliation. Now, we studied this in depth and looking at this in two lessons. I had no idea when I preached those lessons I was going to do a series on the Sermon on the Mount. So I kind of got ahead of myself. But I didn't want to just skip over it in this series either. So let's look quickly at what Jesus says about retaliation and about love. Uh, verse 38, beginning, Jesus says, <clears throat> You've heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him, uh, <clears throat> go with him twain. Give to him that asketh of thee, and for him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Basically here, Jesus is talking about he points out the leader's corruption, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Look, this was a judicial matter, and this eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, if you, you're, you're, you, you killed someone's animal, you would restore an animal. And that's, that was the, the concept. It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and handing out judicial, do, judicial justice. That's what this is talking about. But they turned it into an excuse for personal revenge. Somebody hits you or somebody does you some kind of personal slight and you say, well, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. I hear people say that to this day. I tell you what I think we ought to do, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what the good book says. Jesus says, you, you've missed it. This is talking about judicial matters. They turned it into a, a personal vendetta, revenge. We're going to take vengeance. That's not what he's talking about. And so the Lord corrects them. He prohibits retaliation in verse 38. He says, don't, don't strike back. Uh, there, then he says you've got to practice self-restraint. He points out the concept of self-control, self-denial, and self-sacrifice. Control yourself when you want to strike back at someone. Not just saying, well, an eye for an eye. He says, no, that's in judicial matters. God's people, remember, if you remember those two sermons we studied, we said it could really be these last few verses of chapter 5, beginning at uh, verse 38. They could be summed up with three words. Christians do more. Control, self-control. I'm not. I don't have to strike back. I can control myself and have a chance of winning that person to Christ. Self-denial. I don't always have to have my rights. Everybody's demanding their rights all the time. What about what is right? 
Jesus says, sometimes you need to deny self. And sometimes you need to make sacrifice. Not always about me. What can I do for others to serve others? That's what Jesus came to do, was to serve, Matthew 20, 28. And then the core of this lesson is dealing with your love for your fellow man versus your lust for revenge. People want their rights. People want to get revenge. But Jesus says, that's not what it's about. It's about love for others. And then he goes on and talks about love for all in the last few verses here, 43 to 48. For time's sake, we're not going to read, read those in their entirety. But just notice, he, he, ta- he points out a misrepresentation. He's quoting from Leviticus 19, 18. And, and here's the thing, though. There was a considerable omission. He says, you know, it's been said, you shall love your neighbor. But what does the verse say in Leviticus 19, 18? Love your neighbor as yourself. That makes a big difference, doesn't it? If I love my fellow man as myself, of course, Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan deals with who is my neighbor. If you love your neighbor as yourself, how are you going to love him? How are you going to treat him? That makes a big difference when you decide comparing that to just saying, well, just love your neighbor. So they had a, a significant omission there, but they also had a convenient addition. They were the ones who added, hate your enemy. The law of Moses never said that. It never said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That, that concept is foreign to the Old Testament. And yet, they added that. Oh, love your neighbor, but, but hate your enemy. And so Jesus is going to make a clarification in verses 44 to 47. He's going to point out <clears throat> ideal love. This is what we call agape love. It's the Greek word. It's, it's the kind of love, John 3, 16, that seeks another's good. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Agape love is always giving, looking out for others' best interest. Jesus says we are to have ideal love. We are to have, when we, when we manifest ideal love, it indicates, it's, it's indicative love. It indicates that we are children of the, the Heavenly Father. You want to be a child of God, you've got to love others. Even when they're rather unlovable. Because you know what? When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 6 through 8. God commends his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what ideal love is. It's, it's indicative that we are God's children. You want to be like God, you love others. And it's impartial love. It's toward all. You know, the sun rises on the good and on the evil. The rain falls on the garden of God's children. It falls on the atheist garden. God's love is impartial. Now, there are certain blessings that are reserved just for his children. But God's love is for all. God loved you as much when you were the worst sinner as he ever will. Now, your status has changed if you're a Christian. But he doesn't love you more because you're his child. He loved you so much, even when you were such a horrible sinner living in sin, that he sent his son to die for you. That's ideal love. And that indicates we are children of the Father because it's impartial. I don't pick nationalities or skin color or anything like that. I show love toward all. I don't pick just because somebody's nice to me, I'll be nice back. It's impartial. And then there's an expectation. Jesus, as one writer put it, he throws down the gauntlet here. What is the kind of standard that we are to have? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He makes no apologies when he points out this standard. It is the principle of perfection. It is our standard. It must be our standard. It must be our aim always. As a coach, you're coaching a a group of guys or a group of girls to play a sport or to do something. Maybe it's even in the realm of uh, playing music. You're, you're, You're directing people and you're trying to help them. What do you want the standard to be? Do you want to take this mediocre group over here and say, look, now here's our standard. We get up to that, we're just going to stop. Perfection is the standard. Now, every coach, every director understands we're not going to achieve perfection without ever making any mistakes. But that has to be our standard. That's what we're striving for. That gives us our goal to which we're aiming. And then you have the pattern of perfection. We must not, especially when it comes to loving others, judge ourselves by any other standard than the Father himself. 
In other words, I don't want to go around and look at somebody else and say, well, you know, I know I'm not perfect, but look at brother so-and-so over there. I'm doing better than he is. I'm not perfect, but I'm sure not what sister so-and-so is. Now, that's not the standard. I want to say, you know what? I'm striving every day to be more like my heavenly father. I want to be like the fellow who said, I'm not perfect, but thank God, I'm not the man I used to be. That can be your sentiment this morning. As we already talked about if you need to become a Christian, at the heart of the matter, Christianity is a matter of the heart. God wants your heart. Maybe you need to obey the gospel this morning and give your heart to the Lord. You can do that in just a moment. Come, confess your faith in Christ and be immersed in water. Have your sins washed away. And you can say, I'm not perfect, but thank God, I'm not the person I used to be because I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. As a child of God, remember, Christians do more. Jesus says this is how citizens of the kingdom live. They live by a higher standard, striving every day toward that standard, not of a brother or sister in the local congregation or even someone I admire greatly, but the standard of the Father in heaven who is perfect. That's what I'm striving for, and I hope you are too. If you need to respond to heaven's invitation, won't you come as we stand and sing? And then to Jesus for the cleansing by God who was in the blood of the Lamb. I am fully trusting in his grace this hour. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? Yes, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, ugly, white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and you be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain going for the soul and me. I'll be washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'll be washed in the blood of the Lamb. In the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments of the sun and white and snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Holy song this morning, number 20. 20. You're turning to that, please pass your attendance cards to the center aisle to be picked up as we sing our final song. We invite you back for our evening worship at 6 p.m. We will have pew packers at 540 and look forward to seeing you this evening. Number 20, Beyond This Land of Parting, we'll sing verses 1 and 3 and have our closing prayer. Beyond this land of parting.
Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you once again and thank you for another opportunity that we've had to assemble here, sing songs of praise, and study another portion of thy word. We pray for those of our number who request a part in our prayer. We pray that you will um, return them back to their much wanted health. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray that uh, through obedience to your word that we uh, we have that we might uh, seek that home in heaven someday. Pray that you will be with us and keep us safe as we depart from this building. Forgive us where we fail thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.